visual, it's important to use interactive and visual aids. For instance, if you're talking about a material that could be used for a stent, maybe do a case study with a stent so that they understand why those material properties are so important. Um, I would really like to encourage group teamwork and design projects. I think we all learn so much better when we hear and talk about things with other people from different perspectives. Um, in the class I'm actually, I taught last semester biomaterials, I'd have the students, um, for homework, they'd, they'd criticize or critique a paper from the literature. Then I'd have them come into class, um, break up into little groups, um, then present to each other um, afterwards after they discussed it. And the ideas that they came up with after they talked in groups was so much better than what they would write down in the homework alone that it just really showed that this is such an important process for them to talk it through with each other. They learned so much more. Um, I think it's also really important, especially in this day and age with PowerPoint slides, um, that each class has a few take home messages because you can really hit students with a ton of information. Um, and if you can kind of focus them at the end of it, what was the important aspect, and then link that in next class at the beginning. Um, I think it helps to build upon the different classes and it also helps them to kind of focus on what's important. So current classes in ME that I think I could teach um, that I would be passionate about teaching would be um, some of these intro to mechanical engineering classes, um, as well as the engineering problem solving. I think the engineering design classes are also really interesting, especially the ones that were, they emphasize teamwork, uh, decision making, uh, as well as like project planning. Um, I've also done a lot of experimentation um, and data analysis uh, throughout my PhD and my postdoc, so I think those are two areas as well that I could really uh, find myself teaching. Um, these are more of the biology focused classes, um, so cell and tissue engineering, um, obviously materials engineering because I have taught a biomaterials class before and I really enjoy that, um, as well as uh, bioengineering because it's all of those different things. Um, that we don't really talk about. Um, quantitative systems physiology would be really interesting because I think that that's really important. Um, and then I've had a lot of experience with orthopedic tissue biomechanics from my PhD. It's not something I work on now, but I definitely could teach a class on that as well. <coughs> um, so I thought of maybe three courses that I could develop. Um, so this would either be one or the other, so you could either do a uh, tissue biomaterial interaction class where you'd actually talk about characterization and protein absorption on the material, um, and then how the cell biology interacts with that, so how it synthesizes the matrix, it degrades the material, how wound healing and tissue remodeling affect the dynamics of the biomaterial tissue interface, um, and then really focus on how you use those different criteria and different mechanisms to uh, design medical implants or organs and matrices for tissue engineering. I think a flip way you could do this course would also be to look at um, the extracellular matrix and make it based on that rather than actually the biomaterials. Um, so you look at the mechanics, structure, and function of the extracellular matrix and then how you would use that to actually create the different materials um, and control that cell matrix interaction. Um, another class that would be really interesting because I've done a lot of perfusion system would be a biomems class. Um, so I think this would really, in my vision, would be a literature-based class where you have the students read different literature articles. For instance, this is an Ingber um, paper, the lung, it was in science. Um, and you would teach them how they could actually, and discuss how they actually would create the device, but also talk about how they used it, pros and cons of um, actually that application in cell biology, and how maybe we could build upon it. So making it more like a case study related class. Um, so the last class I was thinking of um, would be a disease modeling class. Um, so you'd be advanced topics on current disease pathology. So you'd start maybe with in vivo animal models and discuss how you can actually manipulate them to control that environment and how we can create disease models with them. And then later you'd move into um, in vitro human models and how you can control that microenvironment and the pros and cons of that. So I'd like to uh, thank all the wonderful people that I've worked with at the Kaplan Lab. Um, in particular, I've had the great opportunity of working with a number of undergraduate and master's students that have really changed the way I think about things um, and have really done a lot of the work that I just showed you. So I'd like to thank them. They're in bold. Um, I've also got some really fantastic collaborators I've got the chance to work with. Um, Jeff Kimball up in Tulane University, um, Maine Medical Center, Michaela and Cliff um, at Harvard Medical Center. Irene Gabriella, and then at the University of Pitt, Casey and Peter. So, thank you so much for your attention. Sure. That was great. Um, so you get your your adipose human cells from like life extension or tiny tubs. 
Yeah. Does that sort of prejudice your samples because you're not getting it from people who don't need a tummy tuck? Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so um, a lot of the tummy tucks are obviously from people that were obese and then they most of them have lost a lot of weight, mm -hmm. um, which actually reverses the process of type 2 diabetes. So they're actually very healthy cells that we get, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of surprising actually that that is so effective but wonderful at the same time. Um, the liposuctioning sometimes is used in surgeries where they are lean, so we can get some lean okay. patients. So they are more obese from the tummy tucks, but we can get the same population. And I have done studies where I've compared um, obtaining it from the lipoaspirate and the abdominoplasty and the processing. It doesn't affect any differences. So. But there's certainly a ton of women and not a lot of men that get these. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> so it's mainly all my, all the what I showed you was women. Wow. Um, so it's definitely not something where you can compare sexes as much. Yeah. yeah. What type of tools do you use for modeling? Oh, for modeling. So for more of the computational stuff that I suggested at the end. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking that would be a MATLAB-based um, procedure. It's not something I've, I've done yet. So it's just something that I would like to do in the future. Um, but I've worked with MATLAB a lot, it's something I'm more familiar with. I certainly would be more open to other modeling tools if other people had expertise and would, you know, give me a, a lending ear or something to, to walk me through it, but that's what I would initially start with. Yeah? So one of the biggest problems in in vitro work is the media that you use. Sure. To the extent that a lot of media that people use is, in fact, hyperglycemic. Sure, yeah. So how do you make the choice for yours yeah, yeah. So I do use a hyperglycemic media. I tried actually going down because I thought tried going down and up to see if it would have differences, and it doesn't seem to have a large effect on the cells. They seem to get used to it pretty quickly, but it's definitely something to think about because there's a lot of different factors that we have to put in there. Um, for instance, you have to put insulin in to kind of maintain their their phenotype, um, so that they're kind of at a hyperinsulinic as well environment. Um, so I think what the coolest thing would be would be to have it be in a perfusion system where you could cycle it, um, and that would be more representative of what they feel actually in vivo. And I think then they would respond more to it as opposed to saturating. And do you use serum too? Yes. Mm. <laughs> have you tried it without? No, I haven't tried it without serum. I think we definitely could do it more to find it for sure. Yeah. For a teaching lab, is there some specific equipment that you would have to have? And have you seen that here today, or would it have to be obtained? teaching labs. Um, so none of the classes I just proposed I think would need a teaching lab. Um, but certainly, yeah, if, if I was to do something that was a, a teaching lab for biomaterials based, I'm sure you'd need some sort of testing units and prepping units, um, which would just be like a wet bench space actually for most materials. Okay. Yep. You mentioned you like the fibroins for the scaffold because they don't use a lot of signaling, but yeah. wouldn't you actually want the native tissue to induce signaling, so I'm not sure what the matrix and, and adipose tissue is, but presumably some collagen and some other things that have RGB sequences that the adipocytes need to adhere to the matrix. Sure, I think, yeah, because I think the matrix is really important. Um, I like that it's actually working, you can control that environment and build in what you want. Um, the, it, it is a small amount of collagen for sure along that stromovascular fraction, but actually a large component of the tissue is actually those um, unilocular adipocytes. So there is definitely collagen along the pathway, but what's really nice about my blended adipose model is the collagen is still there. So it's human and it's from the matrix that they actually come from. And I've actually started to do some CARS, um, coherent anti-Roman scattering, where you actually can look at um, the lipid droplets and then use second harmonic to look at the collagen, and the collagen is maintained right around the cells in certain areas. So I think we do have that matrix. So you said that your chronic cultures last about three months. Yeah. Is that long enough to get kind of the response to chronic? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's a really great question. I think it probably would take three to six months maybe, um, but I wanted to see that it was stable for that long of a period before um, you started hitting it with different factors that would cause it to fluctuate. So yeah, it might need to go longer term, but since I didn't see any differences in three months, I'm hoping that that kind of means that it will last longer. So, so there have been some, um, literature in our group that has brought it out to six months, so okay. um, the scaffolds remain intact, so I think that the adipose tissue should be as well. Yeah. What's the difference between a risk factor and a cause? Oh, that's very intellectual. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think the risk factor um, could be related to a lot of different things. So for instance, um, some people that have 
obesity don't develop type 2 diabetes. Um, so it's a risk factor, so it doesn't necessarily mean it's absolutely going to cause it. Um, does that make sense? But the, the cause would mean that if you have obesity, you're definitely going to get type 2 diabetes. And in this case, I don't think it's actually a direct cause, but related to some other factor plus it that would cause it to be that. Any other questions? Yeah. So, <laughs> sure. So, when you showed the so scaffold, mm -hmm. what is holding it together? Is it is there a physical crosslink or are these chemical crosslink? So it's beta sheet structure. So it's a, a it is a crosslink. Um, so it's interactions between. Is it Van der Waals forces, which is physical crosslinks, or is it actually covalent interactions? or ionic interactions which are chemical in nature? Um, I think it is actually a physical um, crosslink, uh, but I'm not 100% sure about that. It's essentially a crystal structure. Yeah. And so the second question is related to the silk scaffold again. So again, I, I don't know enough about this feed, so if I misspeak something, just correct me. <laughs> so uh, that structure on the right top, the unilocular more lipid morphology, yeah. To that, I think. Yep. So that's what you're trying to get in using your silk scaffold, and that's what you're showing in the right bottom. Yep. That yep. You, you did get it. Yeah. So it's great that you got it, but what about silk? And what about silk, this interaction? What mm -hmm. are the underlying physics because of which this is happening? Do you have any idea? Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, so the silk. Um, is actually, I think, encompassing them. So in some cases, I think that, like for instance, this one right here, um, that was just a, a chunk of tissue that was actually held within the scaffold. But then there are other parts of it, which is right over here, where the cells are actually growing along it and creating um, this encapsulation. So I think it's a little bit of both. So some of it is just actually a physical, just holding down this very buoyant um, tissue, um, as well as actually having the cells um, bind to the silk um, and then holding it in that way. So if I change it from silk, keep the same structure, change it from silk to something else, it would not happen? Uh, no, I, th I think you could use other materials as long as they were inert as well. I mean, you could definitely use some that had signaling um, sequences in it too, but then that would be another factor you're introducing into the system. So I think what I like about silk is that it is actually inert, so you don't have to worry about it actually affecting the signaling. Um, but as long as you had another material that was also inert that you could process in a similar way, I, I don't think this is a silk specific. Kind of related to that, you had talked about silk being, you can control the degradation. Mm -hmm. Is that enzymatically that you're doing it? And, and have you done it? And why would you want to do it? Uh, yeah, so <laughs> it's not enzymatically, so it would be changing actually the processing in the, um, in the silk oh, okay. steps. So how you create that bad beta sheet structure. How much beta sheet? Yeah, so then it'll, so if there's less beta sheets, then it'll break apart more easily. I don't think for an in vitro model, you want it to break down at all. Um, so you want there to be a lot of beta sheet structures. But if you were to take this and actually implant it into a patient, which is very doable because it does have all that signaling components, especially if you took it from one spot and put it into another and it would be within the same patient, uh -huh. that's where you would want it to degrade actually after it had. And you wouldn't want it to happen right away because a lot of the materials right now do that and then they cause um, defects again. So it's nice that it would degrade slowly over time. And I think it would be enzymatically related in the body in that case. Yeah. So I was wondering about the mechanical properties of silk, because you said you can use it as a scaffold for obviously adipose and bone, right? right. Which like in the human body is like pascals to like gigapascals range, okay. right? Yeah. So how do you, how is that like manifestation of change in material properties physically applied in the silk, or is it just that it doesn't change as much in terms of stiffness from the fat matrix to bone matrix? Yeah, that's a great question. So, silk itself can go from pascals to particular pascals. Um, so it's just a matter of changing the formatting. So controlling that beta sheet structure, how long do you actually leave it in the beta sheet, whatever you're using to beta sheet it. Um, also, I mentioned um, that you have to boil the silk to get rid of the saracen. So if you do a longer boiling time, you can really make it a very uh, low molecular weight molecules, which would make it uh, much softer. Um, so that's, those are ways you can kind of play with it, um, using different um, size pores. You can create different stiffnesses as well, so mine are fairly large, which would mean less material, so that would decrease the mechanical property. So if it was smaller, it would have more substance. Um, 
So those are the different ways you create those different mechanical environments. Yeah. Um, as you've developed your model, it seems like you've been able to move away from actual subjects, and but still know what some of those are. Is there a way you can do something that's clinically trial or something like that? Have you mentioned some of that and I missed it, or what would be the next step to go towards that? Oh, okay, so subsets of hum human populations, you mean? Yeah, how would you maybe start applying this to get yeah, human More populations? More clinical, yeah. So, yeah looking at it holistically as opposed to this is a <coughs> that is now like, inside the human and how it's operational. Yeah, so I guess my dream would be that you could, um, you could get the sample from a patient that is going through some clinical trial. Um, and you could do it in parallel and then compare the two results, um, maybe and try some different drugs, not just the one that they're doing. I think that would be the best idea. Um, I don't know how easy that is to get through approval processes, but um, I think at this point it's just in the stage where you track and look at it post, you know, different factors. That would be a good step as opposed to going all the way with people, you can track right. the two together and maybe correlate. Yeah, I think that would probably good be step. the best way, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yep. If you had difficulty, say, in obtaining some of that human uh, tissue, for example, how would you go, what well, would be your workaround? Okay, so we actually, right now, so the life flashboard that we get is sent to us from Pittsburgh. Um, so we have a surgeon that does the abdominoplasties locally, um, but this, they're, the diphocytes are really fantastic. They can be shipped overnight on ice, so I don't ever foresee a, a shortage in fat because they can be, <laughs> they can be shipped. Um, and there's certainly a lot of different places that we could. I'm sure the abdominal plastic could be shipped as well. So if, if it came down to it, I'm sure we could get them shipped from somewhere else. If Colorado indeed is too lean to <laughs> We have some stuff. Great, thanks again. Yeah.